When productivity goes toxic, it becomes a destructive force. When productivity tools and techniques are harnessed appropriately, they are inherently creative. But when it goes toxic, it destroys our health, our relationships, and ultimately, it makes us totally ineffective and totally unproductive. Toxic productivity, it's something I've given an awful lot of thought to. And so I'm going to do a mini-series of four or five episodes of the podcast. A little disclaimer, I'm not a psychologist, so I'm not an expert, but I do have some insights based on my own experience and some reading that I've done. It began life as a mini-series of blog posts, but I'm adapting this and I'm updating it for the podcast. This is episode 27 of the Effective Faith podcast, Toxic Productivity. What is it anyway? My name is Chris Wood and I run Effective Faith, helping you to be more than just productive. At Effective Faith, our aim is to intentionally focus on what matters most, to resist the productivity idol, and to help Christians live effectively for Christ in their everyday work and lives. So let me tell you about my own experience of toxic productivity. This is my confession. The years 2021 and 2022 were the most difficult years of my life. There's simply no other way of describing it. As I look back, I'm forced to conclude that a lot of the groundwork for this had actually been put in place well before this reality became known to me. But here we go. I should note that there were a lot of factors that fed into those years being so difficult. And here today, I'm only talking about one of them. Stress. We all have it. It comes to us from many sources, work life, home life, financial concerns, being overextended. In my experience, it was the ever growing sense that my capacity had been well exceeded long ago. And try though I might to keep on top of everything and to keep ahead of everything, I just couldn't keep up with it all. And it was actually something of a surprise to me each day that somehow everything hadn't unravelled on me. You see, stress affects different people in different ways. Something that you do all day, every day, without breaking a sweat, will crush the person next to you. And equally, they will shoulder the burden with a smile of things that would just leave you broken. You see, ultimately, stress is caused by a feeling of things being out of control. Now, not just in the sense of, well, us mere mortals are never really in control, are we? It's more than that. Stress, it often comes because our expectations for ourselves All the expectations that other people place on us, or even the ones that we feel they might have of us, those expectations are beyond our capacity to meet. You see, in my situation, it was the sheer quantity of things in many different spheres of life that I felt responsible for. In particular, it was the number of things that, in reality, the truth was... I was the first, last, and only line of defence. And the number of things where I placed an unrealistic and unhealthy and just plain wrong expectation on myself to be on top of things and to not make any mistakes. It was a complex recipe. recipe. I didn't understand it then. I don't fully understand it now. So how do you cope with this? That's the question. Well, I turn to productivity and productivity systems. You see, here is something that I wrote down in 2020 as an aim that I had for a system that I was trying to set up. A comprehensive system with a long term view that effectively keeps track of everything coming up in varying levels of detail and that enables me to clearly and accurately see what I need to do, what others need to do, in a proactive way, without overwhelm, 
with minimal input and management and that does not rely on things being stored in my head. That was my aim and in trying to set up this system I failed. Crucially, I think the reason for my failure is because I lacked three key skills necessary to pull this off. Those being omniscience, knowing everything, omnipresence, being everywhere, and omnipotence, being able to do anything and everything. There are a few key things in that aim that I want to flag up as being fundamentally flawed, and they're as follows. Number one, a comprehensive system. You see, I wasn't being figurative here. My aim and the expectation I had was that the system I developed required me to know everything and have a means of recalling it at the right time and to not miss anything, ever. The expectation here was that any, at any given moment of time, I would have access within a few moments to the information that I needed to be able to answer any question that was put to me without being forewarned of the need or the question, and that this recall would be clear, concise, accurate, and be able to cover things in a broad sense, bigger picture wise, or in detail as needed. That was number one. Number two, what others need to do. This is key. I had taken responsibility, not only for knowing what I needed to do, and being clear on what I needed to know, but also I'd taken responsibility for what other people needed to know and what other people needed to do. To an extent, this was an expectation that other people seemed to have as me have of me as well. Number three, without overwhelm, with minimal input, minimal management. You see, some organisations, they have people whose full-time job is knowing what everyone else needs to do. You know, they, they'd be a project manager, for example, whose job is to manage all of the different elements of the project and just keep everybody up to date. That's what they're employed for. You see, my setup was required to have little need for input and little need for management, as managing my time, managing others' time and knowledge. That wasn't my full-time work. I had many other roles many other responsibilities. And so this system had to be so clever, so well thought through that little input was needed to manage everything. And it was simple enough that it could be used without much thought day to day. And you see, as things got more difficult for me to track and manage, my stress levels rose. I became convinced with a bit more thought, a few more tweaks, I could get this productivity system to meet all of those needs, all of those expectations. And I believed the reason it wasn't working was because I wasn't good enough to achieve it. So I tinkered. I switched from this app to the next app. I reorganised my setup. I tried incorporating more and more and then less and less. I didn't have time to do this during the day, at least not at first, so I sacrificed sleep and rest. And so we hit the idea of toxic productivity. This is the idea that we can and we should be able to achieve more and more and more. And it manifests in different ways, doesn't it? It can become an obsession. So in my case, I stopped taking time off, at least proper time off. I constantly needed to tweak and tinker and work and adapt to keep on top of everything. Any moment spare was therefore time to try and improve the system. It can manifest in an inability to switch off, as the phrase goes. Even when we're not working, our minds are consumed by work or by everything that needs to be sorted in our family or home life. It can manifest in that always on mentality and mindset in the organisations that we work for or even at home. You know, your phone always needs to be by your side, your email always needs to be open, you need to be contactable. You see, the reality of our lives is there's always more to do. 
And so it can feel like there's never the opportunity to do something just to rest or to relax or to enjoy ourselves. You see, a common theme that underpins all of this is an inability or an unwillingness to be content and satisfied in the things that are left undone or the things that we've done badly because we didn't have capacity for them. And so here is my confession as I run this channel, Effective Faith. I'm not some guru. I'm not someone who has all of the answers. I'm not someone who stands before you with all of the tips and tricks and hacks. Far from it. I'm someone who has been broken, at least in part, by the very things that I write about and by the very things that I produce content about. And I'm trying to piece together a better way. And I'm trying to do that without making all of the same mistakes that I've made in the past. And as a Christian, I'm convinced that all of this comes from an unwillingness to accept our own mortal limitations and an inability to apply grace and humility in the sphere of our everyday grind and our work. So what is toxic productivity? Well, to start with a theoretical definition, toxic productivity is the desire to be productive at all times. And it goes beyond that to being a need. We feel we need to be productive at all times. This doesn't just mean being a workaholic, because you see, work is just one aspect of our lives. It can mean that we're obsessed with cleaning with sorting, with organising our home. It can mean we're obsessed with managing and maintaining our personal finances. I also believe that it can manifest itself very differently in different people. You see, some of the things I've got in view here don't fit neatly into what traditionally we might think of as productivity. They might, they wouldn't fit into the definition of toxic productivity either. But that doesn't mean they're not a part of it. You see, it just depends on our character and motivation, doesn't it? For example, some of us, we might always be on the phone. We might always be seeing people, catching up with friends or family. We might be thinking that if ever we have a spare moment, then we should be using that to catch up with people, to see them, to support them, to encourage them, to help them. Toxic productivity, it's going to hit us all differently, as we all have a slightly different understanding of what it means to be productive. If being productive means being effective with the time and the resources that we have, using them well and using them to serve some good purpose, then how we define productivity will depend on what we value and what we see as good. Now, I don't here mean some moral good necessarily, although it does include that. But I mean what we value, what's important to us, what matters. And that's going to include um, things that would protect ourselves and others that we care about from harm on the one side, but also actively seeking our benefit and the benefit of others that we care about on the other side. Now, it's going to hit us differently as well. Because being productive has many different elements to it, and any one of them can become toxic and harmful if they're overemphasized. Now, at this point, we probably need to acknowledge that this seems not to affect some people at all. They're totally stress free all day, every day. At least that's how it appears. And we should be thankful for this. No matter how annoying it might be, we should be thankful for that. So let's move beyond the theoretical definition to a practical one. You see, I believe that most often toxic productivity is driven by fear of some kind. It is more often than not driven by the protecting ourselves from harm end of the spectrum. You see, toxic productivity is a situation where 
any aspect of productivity, work, or process by which we get things done, it takes on a significantly greater place in our behaviour and our thinking than it actually warrants. And that is to our detriment or to the detriment of those around us. Now, this can manifest in a multitude of different ways. Constantly tweaking the systems that we use to get things done. Searching for that perfect system that enables maximum productivity. Living convinced that the reason we are stressed is because our system is not good enough. That's one side of it. App switching would be another. Constantly thinking that the next greatest app down the line is going to be the one that solves all of our problems. And so we spend all of our time researching new apps, new tools and moving all of our lives, data, information, tasks, to do's, projects from one app to the next. Changing our to do list app, our notes app or whatever, as again, we're just seeking to maximise our efficiency. Convinced that the latest and greatest will bring us all that it actually promises. You see, reorganising our work, replanning our time, as we're desperately trying to keep on top of everything. It can also manifest in imposter syndrome. There's a podcast that I've done about that a few months back. Because we believe that we're not good enough. We live in fear of the day when we're found out. It can manifest in overloading or overwhelming ourselves with more and more and more stuff. An inability to say no, for example. It can be seen in being always on in practice or just in our minds. There's always so much to do that we cannot, do not or will not take any time out to rest or relax or simply enjoy ourselves. That's a problem for many of us, actually, particularly if uh, we work from home or we um, may manage or maintain a home. There's always stuff all around us that we can see that needs to be done. And when that is there, it is very hard to say, no, actually, I need to stop. I need to take a break. I need to rest. And so this sense of always needing to do stuff becomes toxic, becomes damaging, becomes harmful. As I said, it can be always being on in our minds as well. As Yoda would say, never his mind on where he was, hmm? what he was doing. You see, we're always mentally consumed with our work or the things around us that need to be sorted or the different tweaks or ideas that we might have for how we can improve our productivity system. Uh, or set up to better get things done. You see, these are just some examples. And so it means we're never present with the people we're with. We're never focused on the things that we're doing because our minds are always elsewhere on our work or on the things that we need to do in another sphere of life. All of this, put it all together, or even take it separately if you go to enough of an extreme, it almost always is going to lead us to stress, to anxiety, to fear, and a near constant feeling of failure and of just not being enough. And these feelings, if these feelings and these practices sustain themselves for long enough, then they can be truly harmful to us, to our health, to our well-being, and to those around us. And that is toxic productivity. Now, in the next episode, we're going to think about where this comes from. What is its source? And why is this so often a problem for us? We're going to look at that over the course of um, the next episode. And then we're going to look at the cost that this has to our lives and to our health before we think about a better way forwards in the future. Now, if you've liked this episode, then please do, if you're on YouTube, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel to see the, the follow up episodes. If you're listening on Spotify or on your podcast app of choice, then please do leave a review. Please do pass this episode on to others if you think it would be helpful for them. Send it to them via email, share it to them in a text. 
that'd be great. I'd love for this to be helpful for people who are suffering or struggling with this right now. Now, once this series is over, I'll start to look at some questions. I've got a couple of questions coming in from listeners. If you want to submit a question, then you can do that. If you're on Spotify in the question box below, if you're on YouTube, then you can just drop a comment below the video. That would be great. Or you can email me effectivefaith15.58 at gmail.com or use the contact form on my website, effectivefaith.org. It just want to finish by saying this is a big issue and I hope and pray that as we think through it over the next three or four weeks that that is helpful. Please do tune in on the future episodes and thank you for listening and uh, we will see you next time.